Well, I want to welcome everyone to our 81st Kern Tax Annual Meeting. Welcome uh, today. Uh, I want to at least first give a big shout out to the Baker Shoulder Association of Realtors for hosting us today. Um, this is a critical part of us being able to have our event, and we thank them uh, dearly. Current Tax is a member-supported 501c3 for non-for-profit corporation. The mission to bring about more accountability, effective, efficient, reliable government, basing its actions on common sense, innovation, and a long-term view, Kern Tax crafts positions based on adopted values. It was founded in 1939. Kern Tax is the guard dog protecting the interest of our Kern County taxpayers. Our Kern Tax principles, all taxes and fees, must be fair, must be understandable, must be cost effective, must be good for the economy, all expenditures must be fiscally responsible, must be economically sustainable, and must be societal equitable. I want to thank our sponsors for today. We couldn't have this without the generous support of, a lot of our donors and also our members. Ecom, Gold Sponsors, ERA, California Resources Corporation, California Water Service, Chevron, Clean Harbors, PG&E, Southern California Edison, WISPA, and our gold media sponsor, Heise Media Group. Our silver and bronze sponsors, Baker Shield Associates and Realtors, DSNC, Grimway Farms, Kern Community College District, Klein DiNatale Goldner, Attorneys at Law, McPherson Energy Corporation, Sentinel Peak Resources, Southern Cal Gas, Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Tahone Ranch, the Tahone Indian Tribe, Wonderful Orchards, WZI, and our bronze, Petrotech, Prochorus, and again, I just want to say thank you, our current Leaders Academy through our Kern Tax, with our Kern Tax Education Fund. Today, you guys are in for a treat. We have Today, you will hear from Barry Hibbard from ASU, who sits on the measure in board, and the current outlook, well, you'll, see, you'll, you'll see in how the measure in dollars are being spent and the future of these funds. You will also hear from Jess Frederick from WZI as to where Kern County is after the oil collapse in 2014 and where tax revenues are today. Lastly, you'll be hearing from our main speaker, Dr. Lawrence Yoon. He is the chief economist and Senior Vice President of Research and National Association of Realtors. He will be providing insight on the next economic chapter for our local and national economy. His presentation will include the latest economic forecast, recent development of housing markets, and direction of future home prices, all with a special focus on Kern County. Lastly, I want to thank our committee. We could not have done this at this level without this big support from our team. Jamie Thornberry, thank you so much. Robin Flinning, Kristen Dowd, Holly Arnold, and Ken Huckabee. It has been amazing. Um, I have to, uh, even a bigger shout out to Jamie because Jamie has really put forth uh, this effort to get this all team put together and we're excited to be here. And I hope you enjoy today's 81st Kern Tax Annual Meeting. Now I want to bring on Michael Turnipsey. Thank you, Kevin. I want to thank each and every one of you for watching today on the web on our Zoom meeting. You know, it takes a lot to uh, put on an event like this, as Kevin just mentioned about. And I really want to talk just then quickly, say thank you to our members and the sponsors of this meeting for all they do to keep us running and making us a viable organization within the county. 
Our annual meet, meeting committee has just done a fabulous job, as, he, as, uh, as uh, Kevin said. But what really boils down is the support that the board and the committees do to help me accomplish what we do on a daily basis. Our world has changed with COVID. The world seems to be all about Zoom meetings instead of personal meetings, but the meetings are still there. And in fact, I think there's more meetings now because it's just easier to turn on your computer and invite people. But the big part of this I want to shout out is Freestyle uh, Entertainment Services. Uh, they've worked with us the last three days, getting ready, setting up all the equipment and helping us uh, make sure our presentations are of uh, the quality that they need to be. With that said, our first presentation today is going to be by Jess, I mean, Barry Hibbard, and it's going to be on Measure N. Measure N has probably gotten as much news with us and attention from us and any other issue over the last couple of years. And Barry has worked with me and we attended all the meetings with the city staff before Measure N was put on the ballot and we gave them our insights. We have participated at the uh, oversight committee meetings, the council meetings, and uh, Barry's gonna give us a little, short little review on Measure N and what we think it's going and where it needs to go. So this is Barry Hibbard. Thank you, Mike. Good to be here with everyone. And so to, I think, adequately give you the insight to measure in, I want to step back a little bit and tell you kind of how we got there and what we were, how it all came about. So as I thought back about how we started down this road, I remember it was a early January morning, in fact, January 24th. You could smell the Dagnes in my hand as I'm walking towards the Crest Building. Kind of excited, but kind of nervous. What's this going to be, right? We've got a, a meeting with Andre Gonzalez and Bob Smith, and they want to talk about increasing taxes, right? They want to talk to current tax about increasing taxes. This ought to be entertaining, I thought to myself. So, of course, we got to the boardroom, and there's Mike. He's there, and Brad DeWitt's there, and... For those of you that don't know, Kern Tax tends to spend its money on information, not on facilities. And so um, let's just say it's a cozy environment in the conference room. And so we're kind of climbing over each other, trying to figure out how are we going to position everybody in this conference room and make room for our guests that are going to come and kind of talk to us about a tax increase. And so as Bob and Andre came, and as you might expect, Andre started with a very... Uh, lighthearted and positive message about the city of Bakersfield and the direction and the accomplishments of the city. And many of which I would say we as a group agreed with. And Bob went on to talk more about kind of the specifics about a tax and kind of anchoring some of the points. And then they had the magic question. What do you think? There was a long pause. Do you really want to know? How thick is your skin, I asked. And they said, no, 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 we want to know. We, we, yeah, no, we're here because we want feedback. We want to know what you think. Okay. So we talked in detail about parks and landscaping and some of the deficiencies and some of the lack of maintenance. We talked in detail about crime and the increases in the response times. We talked in detail about perceptions about the fire department and cost overruns and waste. We talked in detail about solid waste and the poor condition of the uh, service trucks. We talked about the homeless problem that at that point was just kind of ramping up. And we talked about economic development or the lack thereof in the city. And I use this analogy sometimes, and this is a little bit generational, so I figured I better get you a picture. So can you imagine what those guys look like in that deal? Anybody remember the old Maxell commercial, right? So the speaker is current tax telling Andre and Bob, here's what we really think 
Are you sure you want to know? Right? So you leave the meeting, and it turned out to be a great exchange, but you leave the meeting, and have you ever had that feeling in your stomach where you walk away and say, was that a little too candid? I don't know. Could have been. Then can you imagine the surprise we all had when Bob and Andre called back and said, can we do that again? In fact, we'd like to have Bruce Freeman and Chris Pollier come in and join you. And let's do this again, because we really want to know what our customers think. Wow. OK. That was the beginning. That's how we got started. Kern Tash got started on the idea of even supporting the one set sales tax. So as we got into it, we pulled together a subcommittee. And we started to work with the city, and we started to understand what are some of the nuances of the city budget. We, um, I would like to take just a pause and mention that there are some very talented people within the city of Bakersfield. And through this experience, we were able to find them, and specifically Chris Hoyt, who did an outstanding job of grabbing information, bringing it back to Kern Tax and to other groups, the chamber and Kern Tax primarily, and then taking it back to the city for repackaging to be able to go out to the constituents. So it was a great experience. And the subcommittee had a real clear mission. If Kern Tax was going to support a sales tax increase, it was going to require the city to be transparent. And that was not something that had always been the case. Leadership had a little different perspective prior to this experience. And this really started the change in the city where people were able to say, look at this. This is a little bit of a new color for the city of Bakersfield. And very exciting at the same time. So everybody rolled up their sleeves. We started to dive into the 2016, 17, and 18 budgets and started to uncover where the money's really going and what's been happening. A couple of things came up. Number one was that the citywide full-time staffing and the levels of our city. So if you see the graphic here, you'll notice relatively flat for about 10 years. But yet during that same time period, our population grew by 12%. At the same time, you have to understand these were authorized positions. So actual positions usually run in a city about 8 to 10% below the authorization level. So at one point, we were about 20% down in staffing, which could be why some of the response times and some of the services weren't quite as readily available and or timely as constituents would like. And so what this, one of the things that came about from the meetings with the city was the need to bring the staffing levels up to an acceptable level based on the size of our city. So that was kind of our first entree into this. The second thing that really became clear was Alan Town and his team did an amazing job of finding the matching funds for the Thomas Tripp road improvements. The graphic you have here shows you the breakdown of where that came from and the $386 million that came in our local matching funds. Well, the question is, when the city was so strapped for cash, where in the world did $386 million come from? Aha. Maybe that's part of the problem. It's also the opportunity, but it's also part of the problem. What we started to understand was that they went out and found the money wherever they could get it, right? They were grabbing from this pile, this pile, this pile, and as a result, some of those things became below, sub, below standard. So as we started to understand the creativity behind Alan and his thinking and the team, it produced a great result, but it actually amplified the problem to a degree. So you take all those funds that you uh, pull together and, and put them up, and you start to say, okay, so where are we going now? What about the things people can see, right? The roads are something everybody gets once it's up, once you're able to travel on it. It's more of an inconvenience while it's going. Everyday people, the biggest thing they see are the parks. And that was something that the city councilmen were extremely proud of. And I think what we have to look at is we do have a lot of great parkland in Bakersfield. The question is, are we maintaining it in the best way we can? 
And are there better models out there that can help us and understand how to maximize our parks and work in conjunction with the school districts for the overall community benefit? The thing that became the most glaring to us was the amount of money, 52% of the budget over a 10-year period, went to two brand new facilities. The Mace Moran Sports Complex and the Kaiser Permanente Sports Complex out there on Taft Highway. Great ideas, right? But boy, did that come at a cost and almost a detriment to our other ones. Now, the next biggest chunk went to downtown Bakersfield, which makes sense to a degree because you have to have a strong core in order to have a strong city. But I think what we really started to understand and think through with the people of the city was, if we're going to be looking at these things, we really have to start looking at kind of a new concept, which is return on investment, right? Now, you would think we were talking Greek when we first started talking about this, right? So as the city moved in and they started on their priorities, these were the 13 priorities that came up from the city's list. After all the meetings, this was what kind of surfaced. Now, you may remember this was called the Community Safety Initiative. And no surprise, six of the 13 priorities do deal with public safety. Now, there was a small nuance in the law, meaning we could not have it be a public safety only, because then it changed the metrics as far as the vote. What we were able to do, though, was get a more complete and encompassing package that enabled multiple areas of the city to benefit. But again, return on investment became kind of the key point here that we started to really understand as we move forward, meaning that sounds like a great idea. How will the community get a return on that investment based on that idea? If we're going to add something to the sports arena, what's the payback period? What's the return on investment? And slowly but surely, you started to really see how those things came along. Now we have new leadership at the city, right? Alan Tandy is retired. Our new city manager, Christian Clegg, and his team are moving the city in a little bit different direction. And it's a pretty exciting direction. What you have before you are the important aspects, according to Mr. Clegg, for the city as we move forward. He's looking to have a consistent community with the fabric for the metropolitan area that allows for more effective delivery of service systems. He wants it to be modern. He wants it to be densified downtown, meaning how do we get more residential downtown? We have one successful residential project, another one that's just clearing dirt, and a couple more that are scheduled. This is gonna begin the transition of downtown as we start to get a work-life balance in the downtown area. The revitalization of urban neighborhoods, a safe, clean environment, and an attractive city that maintains a small time sound feel. Also the modernization and professional of effective government, using technology where we can. And the final point he had was expanding the services of economic and community development through innovative partnerships. So finally a focus on economic development, which is a great addition to the city. So with that, we've kind of overlaid the vision and the new direction and the new staff and the leadership of the city is doing a fantastic job as we move forward. Kern Taxes Initiative. Let's talk briefly about that. Technology may have got me there. The screen went blank. Sorry. There we go. Thank you. All right. Um, Let's talk about where current tax is headed. So as we have shown here with the Measure N, we're looking for things to be fair. We're looking for things to be cost effective. We're looking for things to be understandable and good for the overall economy of Kern County. Expenditures need to be responsible, need to be economically sustainable, and need to have uh, equitable within our society. Those are the pillars of current tax. That's how we approach things. That's how we approach Measure N. Hopefully you found it to be fairly successful as you look forward.
Now, what we've also tried to do with the city is really focus on wants versus needs, and that's kind of an ongoing discussion as the measuring committee moves forward with how we do things in the future. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Barry, for that uh, very energetic presentation. Our second presentation is going to focus on the county issues and the economic kind of ups and downs we've seen over the past decade. Current tax director and past chair Jess Frederick will be addressing this subject today. Jess has a, been in the energy business worldwide for over 45 years. Uh, if there's anybody who's an expert in energy and the markets in this town, it's uh, Jess Frederick. Jess. Put on my mask here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, folks. Uh, a little coffee. I want to thank uh, everybody first for this opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, I'm a numbers guy, very wonkish, so I may go a little slower than everybody else. It's uh, I have the pleasure of presenting the dismal science, the economics. So uh, without much more else, uh, let me get started. So first, I want to thank Mike. Uh, I've worked with Mike on a number of issues, as including uh, participating on behalf of Kern County ratepayers uh, with Kern Tax at the Public Utility Commission. And I'll speak about that in brief uh, with asides where we are currently in terms of our electrical rates. Uh, first and very important, Kern Tax wants to thank Ryan Alsop and Lorelei Oviat for their efforts in transitioning Kern County to be prepared to succeed in the new paradigm that's coming at us. Uh, it's going to be a new paradigm where, where we used to have uh, carbon-based energy as the primary source of energy for the country. It's no longer going to be king, so we'll hopefully there's no world war while we're sorting all this stuff out, or we're going to be pedaling bicycles to the front. Just kidding. So um, here, here's, our, here's where we are in the grand scheme of things from a demographic standpoint. I'm sure everybody here is well aware of it. Uh, these are our neighbors. We share very similar uh, economic uh, support structures for which we provide taxes. Uh, Kern has more oil than the other counties. Uh, we, we all share the same kind of Central Valley environment. I want to talk a little bit about oil. Uh, so it, what you see here is a graph of oil from 1986 to 2019. 2014, we saw a collapse in the oil price. Uh, it is now, on average, oh, why did that not uh, show? Well, OK. So right now, it's averaging about $50 a barrel. And uh, that's close to the average since 1990, which was $47 a barrel. We did see a rate, P, uh, 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 an oil price hike in uh, 2008. That was when we saw $140 a barrel oil. That was during the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and the moratorium that drove prices of oil up. But notwithstanding those, just the fundamental is the inflation-adjusted price of oil for the past 100 years has been flat with the exception of a few occasions, those being wars. Um, so this is what happened as a result of that price drop in 2014. And you can see that our assessed value just dropped. What does that do? Well, if you carry it forward, you can see that the assessed value is lower uh, than our neighbors. So what does that loss of revenue look like, that chunk? Well. It comes to about $145 million, 
of uh, tax revenues that are lost in this new paradigm. The uh, assessed valuation growth should have resulted in about uh, 30 billion. Uh, we're nowhere close to that. So let's talk a little bit more about the revenues by role. So in 2014, oil was 32% of the tax revenues. By 2020, it was 16%. So that source of revenue is gone, and it's not going to return anytime soon. Uh, if, if you're planning on it, you're planning poorly. So who'll carry the freight? Well, you can see 65% of the sales taxes in the county areas are paid by business and travelers. Now this group that you see here has a large year-to-year -year swing, so it's very difficult to plan uh, from an economic standpoint how you're going to maintain your expenses when you can see the kinds of swings that you see in that group that's clouded there year to year. So what does that look like? Well, here's discretionary revenue. For 20, uh, you can see for 2015, we were down 32 million. 2016, down 67 million. 2017, down 60 million. It just goes on and on. So here's, here's where we start running into a little bit of trouble. Since 2010, uh, with the incredible decline in discretionary income, coupled with continuing increases in employee costs, the, co the county finds itself in a conundrum. As you can see, in fiscal year uh, 10 to 11, all county costs were 715 million. In 19 to 20, it was 928 million. That's $212 million increase over that period of time. Uh, the problem is, at the same time, the U.S. gained $5,000 uh, between 2009 and two, uh, 2019. California gained $10,000 in median household income. Kern County households lost $2,500. Now, this isn't the only problem that we face because the PUC just announced that they're going to have a $10 a month average rate within the PG&E rate territory and the service territory. And if you take into account the differences in cooling degree days between the Central Valley and the coastal, the larger coastal populations, that'll translate to about $400 a year for Central Valley residents who are in the, the position to pay rates, and maybe $40 a year for coastal inhabitants. Uh, it's just another tax put on Kern County. So if you add that on there, technically Kern County households have lost $3,000 uh, of median household income by the time you uh, pay your additional electricity bill that just came out. Uh, you know, it's very hard to see Sacramento easing up on the Central Valley residents. So what else has been happening? Well, as you can see, with state and federal funding, the county seems to be able to hire health and human services employees. That's the green and yellow arrow, uh, lines going up, while being forced to reduce other general fund positions. Meanwhile, we have to thank our state government in Sacramento for assisting us in lowering our public safety and putting our officers at greater risk. Just more of Sacramento's great follies. So there's the realignment that you see there in 2011, the misdemeanor adjustments in 2014, and you can see that crime has been steadily increasing as would come to no surprise to a reasoned person. So what does that translate to? Well, here it is. We've added patrol deputies per 100,000 residents. Um, that's, that's a result of simple math. I don't know how they don't get this in Sacramento. Uh, fewer incarcerations and shorter jail sentences equals more crime. More crime equals more risk to the deputies. More crime requires more deputies. 
more risk in deputies requires more dollars. It's just, I, I, I marvel at the silliness of our state government who cannot seem to fathom these inevitabilities. At this point, I want to thank Ryan. Uh, he's taking the county down the right path. At least the mission and vision uh, reflect good governance, and uh, that's, that's a big improvement. Uh, Ryan walks, he talks the talk and walks the talk. Uh, uh, we believe in stated goals. I think that's a good way to get metrics on planning. And this is a breath of fresh air. Uh, we want to see Kern County succeed in, in spite of the rest of the state's actions. We gave the state many years of energy uh, that they seem to have wasted. I, I, I marvel at that. Now we must fend for ourselves as a county. I believe we can do this. Uh, we have been doing so for a long time, and we will continue. So here's what, you know, here, here's where uh, Ryan really comes into play. He's working at realigning the county's machine uh, to be more efficient. Uh, Lorelei is trying to develop new sources of stable tax revenue for the county. Uh, we need to help them. Ryan has upgraded his team to attack these problems and develop advanced technologies, if not state-of-the-art technologies, to help. Uh, the county uh, offices uh, need to uh, sign on and participate and help Ryan achieve this. This is a must-do item. And I want to encourage, on behalf of Kern Taxpayers Association and on behalf of the Kern taxpayers that we represent, that they uh, help with this transformation. We need to save money, or the taxpaying households of Kern will suffer more than ever. So let's just admit it. The state doesn't care about Kern. They just want us to play nice and pay higher rates and taxes. So these are the challenges that we face. The state attacks on loyal, local oil industry, uh, COVID-19, I can't blame the state for that, but I can certainly uh, uh, wander at some of their responses. The state continues to provide an exclusion for commercial solar from property taxes. This is a big deal. We've been sending our solar energy out of the county with no benefit. Solar must pay its share. Uh, sustainable groundwater management is going to punish ag. This one will extend beyond Kern County and will extend into the other Central Valley counties. Look, we need solutions. These are additional challenges that we're going to be facing. Thank you for attending this meeting. Kern County encourages all to join us and participate in our efforts. Kern Tax has been making a difference in Kern County. Kern Tax is looking for partners willing to work and transfer and transform uh, Kern County's future. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. After the first two presentations, you see that we have a lot on our current tax has a lot on its plate in dealing with the city and the county. And we are certainly looking for your input and your ideas of what we should be promoting when we talk to the county and city leaders. Our next uh, segment as was in, as, uh, is Dr. Lawrence Young. He is a vice, senior vice president and chief Econ economist for the American National Realtors Association in Washington, D.C. He is going to be talking about the economic consequences and real estate market outlook with an emphasis on Kern County. So we'll move on now to Dr. Young. Um, the market condition currently as related to the housing market, uh, which is clearly one of the brighter sectors of the economy, um, and even though the rest of the economy is still struggling to get back up, uh, perhaps the positive 
activity in the housing sector could pull the rest of the economy forward in 2021. Furthermore, we know that vaccine is just right around the corner. Uh, let me actually dial back for a second to the March 2020 when we had the lockdown. When the virus first came from China, we saw the television images, uh, quite scary conditions. Uh, and then when it uh, landed in uh, Europe, uh, we heard of even the doctors who were treating COVID patients, like in Italy, where doctors were dying from COVID. So when it landed in the US with the lockdown in place, it was quite scary. Uh, certainly for our realtor members, uh, we did not know uh, if we touch a doorknob and accidentally touch the face, whether that was a death sentence. Uh, certainly for me, for two weeks, I did not leave the home. I was even afraid to go to the backyard, not knowing how uh, it is spread. Um, and then uh, you had the economic conditions. With no one uh, outside, how can you do any commercial activity? So from realtors' perspective and certainly from small business, uh, how do you conduct business? How do you get the revenue that is needed to sustain? And a lot of concerns. Well, here we are late in the year, and what we are finding is that the real estate market has completely surprised. I mean, the year of 2020 is full of surprises, uh, but real estate is one positive surprise uh, as the housing market not only show resiliency, uh, but the growth and expansion, uh, which could uh, perhaps help the broader economy out of the recession. Let me go to the chart because as an economist, I speak better uh, with charts. So bear with me as I upload the PowerPoint onto the screen. Okay, there we go. So let's first start with the broad economy. And as many of you know, GDP is the measure of total production in the US, the bottom line figure for economic condition. And in good times, uh, the GDP would grow roughly three or 4% uh, each year, uh, while during a recession, it may go down to 3%. But what did we encounter in 2020 is completely off the chart. First, a 33% collapse followed by 33% growth uh, when the economy reopened. Now that does not mean we are back to normal. Uh, if you have a high school age uh, student, uh, you may post this question. Say you have a hundred dollar bill, you go down 50% and you recover 50%. Are you back up to hundred dollars? And answer is no. You can do that little exercise yourself. Uh, so even though it looks like a V-shaped recovery, we are not back to normal. If we look at the job market condition, it clearly show that we are still way below the peak employment levels. In fact, this is the total job in the US over the past 20 years. And what it shows is that if we go back to that slight hump in the middle of the graph, that was the subprime lending artificial job creation. Uh, easy loans for anyone, uh, without income documentation, overstretching the budget. Well, it was a mistake, it imploded, and we had the foreclosure crisis and job losses. But from the low point of 2010, America experienced the longest economic expansion ever, 10 straight years of job creation. And this is what President Trump was very proud of, great economy, 10 straight years of job creation, record low unemployment rate, but in a single month of April, we lost all that jobs because of the lockdown. 10 years of job creation gone in a single month. As the economy began to reopen, some of those jobs are being recreated, but as you can see, we are roughly halfway there. We need another 10 million jobs to get us back up to normal. I put that red line as a reference point for year 2000, which coincidentally is the bottom point uh, during the foreclosure crisis and also meeting the uh, lockdown period for the US. If one looks at the California market, uh, you look very similar. So you see that little hump in the middle of the graph and then 10 years of job creation, and then you went down, then job creation. 
Only thing is that you are a little above the red line. California is a little above the red line, showing that overall, over the past 20 years, California outperformed the rest of the country in terms of the job performance. But if we look at the Bakersfield area, you see that it is well above the red line, which shows that Bakersfield is actually doing much better than the rest of California. So even during the foreclosure crisis, you really did not suffer to the degree that, say, the Southern California, Northern California, you know, LA, uh, the suburbs, the suburbs or nearby city near San Francisco uh, suffered through. So it was um, a recession uh, during the foreclosure crisis, but not a big hit in the Bakersfield region. And then 10 years of job creation, then you went down. And now you are trying to come back up after the lockdown. So Bakersfield, certainly doing much better compared to the rest of the state in California in terms of a 20-year job market performance. Let's look at all 50 states as way they stand. And interesting part of this graph, which shows all 50 states with lower employment situation compared to one year ago. So fewer jobs compared to one year ago. But if you look at Idaho and Utah, they're almost back up to their prior peak level, only 1% down. So it's just a matter of one or two more months before they go positive, more jobs than what it was one year ago. But if you look at New York, Michigan, Pennsylvania, along with California, where you had a stricter lockdown and for longer period, you see much severe negative job market conditions. Nevada and Hawaii, they're tourism dependent, and tourism dependent area, they're down a lot. Even Orlando, Florida, they're down a lot. Uh, even the rest of the Florida is doing reasonably, holding on reasonably well. So what it shows is that depending upon the governor's policy on lockdown, you can have a better recovering economic condition, job creating condition, or you can have a very slow job market recovering condition. And California at the moment would be at the more slower job recovery condition because of the stricter lockdown uh, in the state. Um, so very interesting. And also uh, right before the pandemic, all 50 states back in February of this year, all 50 states had extremely low unemployment rate. Now things are beginning to diverge. And uh, even though the economy is now fully back up to normal, Interesting aspect is that income is actually higher now compared to one year ago in the aggregate. I know some families are really struggling, but if you add up total household income across the country, income levels are higher. Why? Because of the massive stimulus. I know I'm talking to the Taxpayer Association. You know that if there's a massive stimulus, it means huge deficit. And yeah, deficit is just out of the water, just blowing up. Uh, but the stimulus uh, a check has provided the income boost for many uh, families. Uh, $1,200 check, the enhanced unemployment benefit, which means that someone working at a department store like Macy's, they got laid off. And what do you know? Unemployment check is actually higher than the wages they were receiving. Uh, in addition, small business administration loans, which uh, if people meet certain criteria, one does not have to repay. So all this stimulus has provided the income support. So the goal from Washington perspective, and it was a bipartisan measure, uh, and President Trump signed it right away, uh, was to say that let's fix the economy and worry about budget deficit in future years. So let's try to fix the economy. So what are people doing with this extra income? They're not fully spending. The savings rates win really high. Normally, uh, people would save about seven or 8% of their income, but when the stimulus checks were distribu distributed, uh, people essentially saved that, that money, which hints at once the vaccine is available, and it's just right around the corner, you know, there are several companies making a, a tremendous progress as related to the vaccine research, uh, and hopefully it's widely available by spring of next year, once it's available, one can easily envision the unleashing of this savings back into the economy. Going to the baseball games, able to go to the restaurant, 
Uh, so that there's a possibility for economy to really begin to move into higher gear uh, once the vaccine becomes widely available. Now let's turn to the really good news, how the housing market has been playing out. And hopefully many of you are homeowners are and benefiting from the rising housing market condition, uh, but it can also begin to help lift the broader economy along with it. So home sales, from 2018 to current, what you are seeing is this chart. So let's look at that V-shaped uh, chart that you see, that little swish condition. Lockdown, home sales went down, but once the economy reopened, it really came back and then some. Home sales in recent months are actually better than one year ago. One year ago, many realtors would have said it is a good year, solid year. Autumn of this year is doing better than that. So tremendous activity. Also note that I put little arrow back in the year 2018, little sliding down, sliding down of home sales at that period. Nothing major, but at least it's sliding down at that period. Let's look at the newly constructed home sales. Also booming. Recent data showing 30% higher home sales in September compared to one year before. And also you see that little arrow during the 2018 period. What about pending contracts? This is what the realtors uh, gauge related to signed contracts, which means that closing will be in a month or two. So it is hitting all time high. I mean, it's, uh, I think August was all time high. It retreated a little bit in September, but about 20% above one year ago, which means that this winter would be one of the strongest winter home sales activity ever. So you compare this year winter with past winters, a uh, very, very strong uh, activity related to closing because pending contracts are already very elevated. What do realtors say to their clients to demonstrate seriousness? Get a mortgage. That is the first step in the home buying process. So consumers are applying for mortgages at much higher level now than before, about 20% higher compared to one year before. This is the very first early stage of home buying process. In other words, there are potential buyers in the pipeline ready to hit the marketplace so upcoming spring could be one of the best spring season ever because there are buyers lined up in the uh, pipeline to enter the marketplace. Also note 2018 arrow going down, uh, fewer mortgage applications. So what is that 2018 activity really about? Mortgage rate went up. Back in 2018, mortgage rate at the beginning of the year was around 4%, then it reached 5%. This shows how sensitive the housing sector is to changes in interest rates. Back in 2018, President Trump would have said great economy, job creation, low unemployment rate, all good for the economy, but the interest rates were rising and that at least diminished some of the home sales activity. Why is the home sales market so strong during the pandemic? Well, independent of the pandemic, always, interest rates play a huge impact for home sales and mortgage rates hit record low levels. Federal Reserve monetary policy is the most expansionary ever, meaning very liquid policy. You know, Fed funds rate essentially is zero, mortgage rate record low, quantitative easing, buying government debt, mortgage-backed securities, and buying those uh, government debt uh, it's coming from printed money, uh, you know, so there's a lot of printing of the money uh, in order to get the interest rates down. Now, at some point in the future, printed money turns into inflation, interest rate will be rising. But at least in the immediate years, 2020, 2021, uh, at least uh, the, the interest rates are falling from the maximum Federal Reserve policy to provide the liquidity. This is the percent of income devoted to mortgage payment for the first time buyers. Uh, and 2018, you can see is rising. But interesting thing to note in 2020 is that it's not falling even as the mortgage rates are falling. So mortgage rates are falling. So why is the percentage of income devoted to housing payment not falling? 
And the answer is home prices are rising much faster than income growth. So uh, if home prices continue to rise 7 8%, or even in the double digit percentage gains, and the interest rate no longer decline, then we could face some trouble for first time buyers. So at the moment, the affordability condition is very favorable, but if the interest rates no longer fall, and I don't anticipate any meaningful decline from this point onward, if anything, there's going to be some slight increase going into 2021. So we need to assure that home prices do not rise so quickly, otherwise it could choke off the market. Let's look at the price condition across three uh, cities in the California market. The orange line is San Francisco, the gray line is LA, and the bottom line is Bakersfield. Uh, I Starting from 1995, where every index is 100. So this is not a medium price, it's an index which shows that uh, if, per, if you purchase the home in 1995 in San Francisco, uh, today uh, it will be about five times higher. While in Bakersfield, it will be about two and a half times higher. So it shows the relative performance. But even back in 1995, we know that prices in LA and San Francisco were much more expensive compared to Bakersfield. But what has happened over this uh, chart period is that price appreciation was even stronger. So he's essentially saying that expensive cities experience even faster home price growth compared to Bakersfield. Now, this was a positive news for Bakersfield going forward because people in San Francisco and LA, they are saying, I cannot buy a home. Home prices are so expensive. Are there other regions of the country, other regions of state where I could potentially buy a home? So you may, they may begin to consider Bakersfield as one of the uh, options. And another development from pandemic is this work from home phenomenon. If people can work from home and don't have to go to office in downtown LA or downtown San Francisco, maybe they're looking to be further away from these cities uh, and they can get more affordable homes at larger size. And Bakersfield will certainly benefit from this trend of working from home. Because prices have risen, there's a sizable housing equity. Homeowners are smiling. I mean, renters may be frustrated, but homeowners are smiling. The top line is the real estate asset valuation in the aggregate. The bottom line is the mortgage outstanding. So the gap is the housing equity. And right now is at an all time high of better than $20 trillion. Hypothetically, if home prices was to decline somewhat, there is plenty of equity to absorb the price decline. So don't anticipate anything like the foreclosure crisis of 10 years ago. Uh, if somehow the prices were to decline. First, I am not calling for price decline. I want prices to rise more slowly. But even if the prices were to decline, the homeowners for the most part can absorb slight decline as there is a sizable equity. Why is the prices rising so much? We simply don't have enough inventory. Normal balanced market condition would be something like five, six months supply of inventory. Today, we have a record low two and a half percent, I mean, two and a half months inventory. So very tight condition, which is the reason why multiple offers are quite prevalent uh, in the starter homes or even middle price uh, points. So multiple offers are leading to prices getting, getting pushed up way, way too fast. Are we going to get any inventory relief anytime soon? And the answer is unfortunately not, because way to get more inventory is two ways. One is for real estate investors to sell their properties. And if they do, then we have more inventory. Homeowners selling their property really do not increase inventory because homeowners really become renters. They just, they're just buying another home. So they're uh, putting their homes on the market, but they're buying another one. So it really has to be real estate investor or the second option. And the second option is for the builders to build more homes. Housing starts, we need greatly more housing starts. But what was the building activity over the past 10 years? It is well below the orange line, well below the historical average. 
The cumulative effect of underproduction for the 10 years is that we have a housing shortage. And that's why we have multiple offers. That is why home prices are rising so strongly. So we hope that by 2021, the builders can get very active. I know in California, they're very restrictive on zoning laws, uh, environmental policy, and the builders are saying, heck, you know, I'm going to Arizona, I'm going to Utah to build homes uh, because it's almost impossible to go through all the bureaucratic papers, go through the hoops in order to build homes. And that's why California is so expensive because of the lack of supply. Maybe you can do something in the Bakersfield region uh, because especially with the work from home phenomena, uh, there could be a rising demand for housing in more affordable regions uh, in California. So why are the builders being held back at least right now? One is a very uh, high prices related to lumber. Uh, wildfires out in the Western states is one of the reason, but placing tariffs on foreign lumber, especially Canadian lumber is also raising the price. So one way to lower the price quickly is remove those tariffs on Canadian lumber. And by doing so, we can create more jobs in America not necessarily in the lumber industry, but in the home building industry. As builders build more home, that means job creation uh, in the local community. So if the lumber prices can come down by removal of tariffs, uh, that will certainly help. The other op uh, option, I mean, other uh, additional uh, thing to help the home building is let's look at where people have lost jobs. People have lost jobs during the pandemic, principally in the hotel and the restaurant in the retail sectors. Home construction is holding on. Office-related jobs like finance and insurance, interestingly, they're creating jobs. So it's almost a condition where you have the frontline workers taking it on the chin, but the office workers, they're not going to office. Offices are being underutilized, yet people are working from home. So job creation in the finance and industrial uh, insurance industries. And if you look at the weekly earnings, the green bar chart, uh, you see that people who lost jobs, they are principally in the low wage industry. So is there a possibility for vocational training to move people who have been unemployed into higher paying jobs like construction? Because builders will say if they have more construction workers, they can build more homes. So maybe we can work on something to move uh, people who used to be in hotel and restaurants to go into construction. Now, one good story, I remember uh, reading a story about New York City chef in a restaurant closed down. So he went into the construction and he said, look, he's very happy working outdoors. And not only that, he's making more money. Uh, you know, so something along that line, I think will help on the home building industry. The inventory increase is critical. We need more inventory. Let's now look at the uh, new economy of working from home. Office leasing down tremendously because even some companies who may be expanding, who would need an office if people are able to work from home? When we took survey of realtor members about their clients, where are they looking at their home? Suburbs, rural areas, smaller towns, and away from urban city centers. Result area should be generally less than 10%, but now clicking at 13%. Why? Work from home. If people do not need to be so close to downtown centers, then they can go to the second, third ring of suburbs, or even further out, two hour drives away. So, you know, Bakersfield, I think could potentially benefit as more companies provide this option. I know that Twitter has announced to their employees, you can work from home forever. Facebook believes half of their employees could possibly work from home forever. Microsoft is taking application from their employees, justifying why they could work from home. And uh, many other uh, companies, I think it will be some type of hybrid, rather than come to downtown LA five days a week, maybe it's only two days a week. Uh, and if that's the case, people will consider moving further out uh, and even school choices. People may say, you know, if I have to work in downtown, uh, there's three school districts I will consider. 
But now if people don't have to commute to downtown, they may expand it to rather than three school district, they will look at 20 school district. So all this part, I think will play uh, uh, in this new economy of the flexibility to work from home. Home sales in vacation counties are really taking off right now. So uh, areas near Lake Tahoe, uh, you look at the mid-Atlantic beach towns, Cape Cod, all taking off Colorado mountains because working from home can also mean working from vacation home. I mean, who would know the difference? You are on a Zoom call, put some background, uh, you know, it's work from anywhere environment. So home sales really taking off in the vacation counties uh, as well. So the forecast is the following. As related to the economy, 2020 is a down year, uh, unusual year, pandemic. So we would have lost 7 million jobs even as the December job creation comes along. But the vaccine is just around the corner. 2021 will be positive. Interest rate policy will be very low. The Treasury yields at only 1%. Uh, inflation, not a problem yet, even with so much printing of the money. I think that printing of the money will begin to show up probably five or six, seven years from now. Uh, I think many of you remember the 1970s when the inflation was 10%. Uh, well, the interest rates were in double digit percentage as well. But in, at least in the uh, immediate years, I don't see the inflation as being a problem. If we look at the housing market, mortgage rates should remain favorable. Only five years from now, I think it will be very concerning because of inflation, uh, which will push up interest rates. The new home sales, whatever the builders build, they can easily sell it. Uh, so rising solid 23%. Existing home sales in 2020, even though we missed the spring buying season, second half is so strong that I think it's gonna squeeze out a gain overall in 2020. Then in 2021, we get the second order housing demand. What is the second order housing demand? These are homeowners who never considered buying or selling their home uh, before the pandemic. They were very content. Suddenly, because of the pandemic, they say, a uh, four bedroom house is insufficient. We need to have the fifth uh, bedroom house to turn it into office space. Or maybe they want a bad, better, uh, bigger backyard or considering different school district. All that factor, second order housing demand, along with job creation, along with a, a very low mortgage rate will boost demand by roughly 10% in 2021. Home prices in no danger of declining I hope it tames down rather than 10% growth uh, in this. In some uh, markets, it's showing uh, you know, prices should only rise roughly 3%. There will be healthy levels. So let's see how it plays out. My final slide is this. Uh, I don't want to be presumptuous to say Joe Biden will be the president because President Trump has all the legal rights to recount and other uh, uh, areas to assure that the election process uh, meets the integrity. Uh, so uh, President Trump should go into that, uh, all the uh, potential avenue to assure that the election was proper and all the votes are uh, counted, legal votes are counted. Uh, but if the Las Vegas was placing it out as to where, who will occupy the White House, I think they will say 99% chance uh, Joe Biden will be in the White House. So using this as a likely scenario, what is Joe Biden saying about certain stimulus measure as related to real estate? He wants to introduce something called home buyer tax credit that will be available at the closing table, uh, $15,000, which in essence would be like a down payment assistance. Uh, certainly there would be some income phase out so that millionaires do not qualify. I don't know how that will, you know, what the income limitation would be, but essentially trying to help on the home buyers. But let's remember, we have plenty of demand. So adding additional demand without increasing supply could lead to even, even higher uh, home price growth. So 1031 exchange is a real estate uh, a tax uh, benefit where you can sell a land and not pay a tax on capital gains as long as you do a like kind exchange. And Biden campaign said they believe this is a tax loophole so they wanna remove it. But we believe that this is critical for commercial real estate, getting the small business community uh, activity. 
uh, and especially turning raw land into developable lots for the home builders to build. So we want to communicate the message how important 1031 exchange uh, to the Biden campaign, uh, because removing it, I think it will restrict supply, and that is the last thing we want to uh, do. I think Joe Biden will appoint Federal Reserve governors who are more tolerating of higher inflation, meaning looser monetary policy uh, over the next four years, uh, and a bigger fiscal policy because uh, Joe Biden wants to spend more money on many, many things. Now, one of the things that he should uh, spend money on uh, are, is the expansion of the fast internet access in rural communities, smaller towns. Uh, it should not only be the cities, the big cities where they have high-speed internet, uh, so maybe some type of uh, help in getting the high-speed internet across all America. Uh, he may also extend the mortgage forbearance. People facing trouble, they can skip mortgage payments right now, all the way up to March 2021, but maybe he wants to extend that if the job market do not fully recover uh, or the job market is still struggling uh, at that point, it remains to be seen. Uh, and the, uh, if there is a uh, lockdown, uh, if uh, uh, Joe Biden imposes a nationwide lockdown, uh, in my view, I think it would be terrible uh, for the economy. Uh, it will surely help on the containing the virus, uh, but in terms of the economy, I mean, to have a second recession, I think that's gonna be really tough going uh, for many business owners. So uh, it should be more of a case by case, micro level. And certainly from my perspective, home buying is much, much safer than going to the grocery store. So real estate should be considered a central service open uh, as people are looking at their all, all options about their residential choice uh, and we should not limit that. Uh, so anyway, it will be interesting to see uh, how all of this policy plays out and also who you know, controls the Senate, whether the Senate uh, will compromise on various measures. Uh, so it remains to be seen. But uh, thank you very much for giving me time to share some of my thoughts with you. Uh, and now uh, I'm gonna turn it back uh, to the moderator and thank you again uh, uh, very much. Thank you, Dr. Yoon, uh, for that uh, amazing presentation. We really appreciate it, and um, thanks for uh, sharing that, and, and we're looking forward to 2021. With our from closing folks, I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, please send any comments to our webpage and or email us uh, with anything. Uh, if it deals with the city and the county, uh, straight to uh, Kern Tax. Also, become a member. Um, we have members coming in throughout the year, and obviously, as everybody else knows, it has been a very tough year, but we are the watchdog for our tax dollars here. You have the most brilliant minds from every industry in Kern County sit on this board. And as a member, you have them. You have them there for you. Mike Turnipseed's there for you. You saw Jess Frederick. You saw Barry Hibbard. Um, we have so many great folks that have the, the, the amazing mindset from their own industries. So please, call Michael, call myself, uh, email us. Let's get together. We'd love to, love to share the story with you some more uh, and become a member of Current Tax. Uh, we need uh, the support and we're here for you 24-7. We also want to say, you know, go out to our Current Tax website. We have the Conversations That Matter series that uh, Michael had started during this COVID time. We have a great conversations with Ryan Alsop, our CAO of the county, uh, also with uh, Christian Clegg, the new city manager of Bakers for Bakershold. Um, and join us. Let us know if there's any other ideas out there for the, um, the Conversations That Matter series that we could be part of. Um, and again, uh, our next event coming up is going to be Spring Golf Tournament, March 15, 2021. Now, right now, we have it set for March 15, 2021. I mean, things can change, but right now, put that on your calendar. And, and come out and support us. Um, again, I just want to say thank you for joining us today. And I just want to wish each and every one of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We'll see you next time.